there must be something like faith because otherwise I don't know why I'm here. Why am I here and why is not the rest here? Why, when I go through so many things, why am I here? I don't know. That's sometimes maybe because they tell the story. I think that the unique thing about the Holocaust and about the, um, the plan to exterminate the Jews and the execution of the plan was that there was a central act of state. It was the policy of the German government at that time. And everybody was involved. very patriotic family. My father was <laughs> in World War I, and uh, both my mother and my father were in the American Legion program, and that was really our social outlet besides church. And uh, so uh, my mother had the song, uh, Rose of No Man's Land, which is a, has a picture of a nurse on it, she, that was, and uh, from World War I, and she used to play that a lot. And uh, somehow I just, felt like a kind of what I liked the idea of nursing uh, and especially in the service we happened to be near um, Germany in Germany we happened to be near Dachau and it just seemed our turn to <laughs> uh, go into Dachau as a an evac but not as surgical not like a, like a wartime job because and then our doctor went in uh, commanding doctor went out in and the uh, he kind of surveyed the thing and saw what he could do, what we could do, you know. But it was, and then we, we all came in with him uh, in about a day or so. And uh, we, <coughs> so it wasn't, it was a direct assignment that, you know, to uh, go in there and take out the patients because we had to, they couldn't let them loose on the, on the uh, populace because well, they all had all these bad diseases and some were too weak to move and everything. And the patients that we took out were, uh, well, the doctors went in and, and uh, they only removed those they felt they could could save, you know, really. Some of they were dying a oh, tremendous amount a day uh, just by typhus and everything. And uh, so they just, so probably there were supposed to be 30,000 in there but I don't know how many everybody finally got out of there. How they finally processed them all out because I before they finished the project. And there was another hospital in there too after us who did stuff too. But I don't, I didn't see them and know much about them. Had you heard about the existence of uh, these concentration camps before well, you? Uh, yeah, ended up in there? a general way, uh, I haven't exactly. The, I don't know the exact timing on. Um, when the others were freed, but uh, they all were within that general frame time time frame of the when we went in for this one. But those were farther north, the ones that they went into first, the Buchenwald, I think, I believe. But Dachau was the oldest of all concentration camps, they tell us, and one of the very first, and one of the oldest, the first and oldest. <laughs> You were always ready because there was always a backpack. In that backpack were your clothes, your shoes, and new things because you thought and you had the idea you go to a work camp. Nobody knows at that time there were concent uh, real concentration camps. Even before the war, when Jewish boys and girls came from Dachau into Amsterdam, 
We had him in the Jewish homes. I spoke with them because I did speak German, so I could conversate with them, and the Dutch boys and girls couldn't so easy. We didn't even believe it. We couldn't believe it. We didn't want to believe it, that things were like that going on. We thought it was nothing than sensation, and they wanted to get out and come to us, until that happened to us, when they invaded at Holland. And then what happened? Now, I jump from one thing to another, but uh, then my farm, we had not too far from ours, was a very nice district. We had a Israel, they call it uh, Israeli's uh, hospital, Israelitis hospital. That hospital was like more than a block long, a block and a half long and wide. And was very well known of the good service and good doctors and Jews, of course, and especially Orthodox, and, and the Gentiles wanted to very well going through that hospital because they know they had first-class doctors there. One day, nobody could go through that. That was like on a canal, but across the street from the canal there were streets and houses. It was all spared. They was all closed off. And you didn't know why until you saw big trucks getting the people out of the hospital. They closed that whole hospital with doctors in there, with my cousin and other cousin's husband. She and her husband worked at that time in the hospital. Because if, at that time, if you worked, you got numbers, and that kept you out for so long until they got you anyhow. They closed that whole thing up. They took the doctors. They took the patients. They took the people right under surgery. And that is when my father said, they can tell me everything. Now I know what's happening to them. They kill them. You cannot tell me. When there is a beautiful hospital that they get all taken care of, what are they going to take these people out of for? To kill them. That's when we start thinking there must be something else than just war camps. And then a lot of them went more into hiding. But we would depend on that number. They took all their measures uh, very gradually. Uh, the first measure, the active measure against the Jews was that uh, they couldn't participate in the anti-air raid patrol uh, activities. Um, they did it all in, in very small incremental steps so that each step by itself didn't seem worth having a strike over or protesting against. Um, when you want to deport people, like they wanted to eventually deport all the Jews, you first have to know who the Jews are. And they made us, they got the Dutch people and the Jews themselves to help them to do it in a diabolically clever way. The Germans give us papers and they say, you fill out how many Jewish grandparents you had and so they got it all registered. But otherwise, we did ourselves, they would have never gotten the Jews the way they were because they were not registered. So, I don't know what to say. Uh, and we were very naive as a country. Um, they sent out uh, the so-called Aryan attestation. It was uh, everybody received two forms with the same questions, uh, like if, if there was the army, it would be name, rank, and serial number, but it was address, telephone number, occupation, marital status, how many children, what kind of work, and then there was this final th uh, thing that said Jews had to send in form A and Gentiles had to send in form B. And very few people caught on to the fact that by filling it out and doing that, we were telling the Nazis who the Jews were. At Dachau, they just buried everybody. And they've got a quarter of a million people buried there because that was the first of the uh, camps, 1933 to 1945. And uh, 
thousands of people were slaughtered there. Anyone who said a word against Hitler was shot, you know, including 600 priests and 1,200 nuns. This gas chamber that I did see was, uh, you walked in and then there was a kind of a wide narthex type long room or thing just as you entered. And off of that were all these different rooms. One was the gas chamber itself, and then a little room next to it that had the glass window that they looked through to see if they were, after they gassed them, if they were dead. And then next to that were two other rooms. Well, they weren't as big as this one quite, but they were as long as this one, but maybe about as, about as far as him, him over there. And they, those were bodies that they hadn't had a chance to take to the crematory yet when they were surprised. It was filled just like, have you ever had occasion to see cobs or coal in a bin? And so they were just thrown up like cordwood. The first American Army officer to be at Dachau was Brigadier General Henning Linden. Right after V-Day, he showed me, uh, he sent me some uh, films showing the liberation of Buchenwald on April the 11th. 1945 and the liberation of Dachau on April the 30th, 1945. He asked me to show these films to the 300 German prisoners of war that we had at Stark General Hospital, Charleston, South Carolina. After I showed the films, one of them came over to me and he said, I don't believe any of this. This is all Allied propaganda. But another German prisoner of war standing next to him said, Warum sagen Sie das zu dem amerikanischen Ober? Sie wissen, dass wir hatten Dhaka in München geschmeckt, 13 kilometers weg. Why are you telling this to the American colonel? You know that we were able to smell Dhaka in Munich, 13 kilometers away. There's a lot of people helping people in the, within the compound. And when our doctors went in, they said, saw these in the compound, the units where they lived, these barracks, they just had enough shelf space. They didn't have any cots of any sort, you know. They just had to lie on shelves, and there was just enough shelves for half the people that were in the room. So half the people would be lying down, and the other half to be, had to be on the floor, or sitting up, or standing up, or whatever. But they were all so weak. <coughs> But, um, so they told us about that. <coughs> and then, but I myself then saw the, the uh, a place where they had done ceramics and glass. And the, the GIs were so mad when they came, they dished their gun butts and ran it across the shelves of the brand new, the new things that were, just broke everything they could, could break. And uh, they were just, just so mad. <laughs> they just couldn't believe all that. And, but then they didn't stay there very long, you know, they just kind of had a certain amount of... I went, I took a trip one time in Austria and I went past Mauthausen. All of a sudden I saw a little name, it says Mauthausen. I said, Mauthausen, that must be the concentration camp, you know. And uh, so I felt my duty once I know. I wasn't going there especially, but I, I saw the name. And so I went, and let me tell you, Never in my life I will do this ever again. I went in there and I stood there and it was like, it was like I could just feel all the tears and the pain. My whole body was shaking. I had a necklace on and I always used to call them my teardrops. They were white with like a tear water in there. I had to die, broke right off my neck. And I stood and I thought, that's all our tears are laying here. And I wanted to first leave these beads where they were, and I found them all by one and one. And that's the craziest, and I wanted to take them and bury it in the Jewish cemetery. And for some reason, I can't find these beads. And I told it once to a rabbi, and he said, so many strange things has happened in these places. 
I don't know just what I, what I would say except that they should accept the fact that and hope that nothing like that would ever occur again. Hopefully. Well, and we, we don't think that should would here in our country. We hope. <laughs> but, uh, cannot happen to me. Oh, we don't allow this. We don't allow this. What do we allow? That is scared the daylight out of me. And I, many times I lay there at night and I think, my God. Here I thought I ran away from it and here it just worse at the moment. Because there we know it. Here we don't know. We don't know yet who they are. There we know who they were. Even the word Dutch Nazis the Dutch know who they were. Here it could be your next door neighbor and you don't know. What's that? Waiting to hear the clan. What do you think they're going to say? Uh, I don't know. That's what I'm waiting to hear. Uh, okay. They're not pretty predictable or anything like that? Never seen them before. Uh, community organizations, socialist groups, um, you know, all kinds of different groups that they can support. In Freeport and Janesville. Yeah, Janesville, Freeport, Rockford. Rock, uh, I mean, uh, Rockford. And uh, now Chicago. And the, main, the, the basic idea for us is that to kind of build a loose network so that whenever the clan shows up anywhere, we can build the largest counter demonstration as possible. We're, we're organized around the idea that anyone who believes that we need to confront the clan, you know, and because always when the clan shows up somewhere, there will be uh, people in the community who say, ignore them, and they'll go away. And you're only giving them attention, and so on. And our view is that the, they already get attention from the press. I mean, the local paper in Rolling Meadows, you know, publish pictures of the hats and the t-shirts the plan is going to sell this weekend. You know, giving them basically free publicity. And that we believe that since the Klan thrives on fear and intimidation, like in Janesville, they shot into the bedroom of a little of a, of a, of a, of a black girl into her parents' home, shot into a bedroom. And, and they thrive on that kind of intimidation and violence. And so we believe that you have to turn that around on them and make them feel like they're not welcome and that there's always many, many more people who oppose them and who oppose hate. And it isn't, you know, we also believe that, you know, there's all, people make arguments about free speech. And we say, well, if there was a, a meeting of mass murderers at the McCormick Place, would we be for... We come from free speech. We, come from. we say it's not a free speech issue. It's an issue of like, where people preach violence and they act on it. I mean, they're these are the people that are in these militias, organizations. Well, we're here representing the Fokulo, Aitigilo, and the all right. I mean, even despite the B'nai B'rith calls to like ignore this kind of thing, you know. So up to them. The Jewish communities on campus are going to be here. And it, it, we don't have to scratch the surface too deeply to see um, uh, prejudice, hate, anti-Semitism, or a, a whole agenda um, designed to uh, um, to to. Um, uh, help calluses grow over people's humanity. Um, uh, it's uh, it's in the interest of some people to get others to look the other way, so nobody cares about what happens to to others. Um, it's a small group of people. They uh, they exploit their uh, their rights in this country um, that allow them to be able to 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 say or think whatever they want. Um, and exploit sometimes the naivete and gullibility of others who, who help them along in, in, in spreading lies and, uh, and misinformation. Um, sometimes it would almost be laughable and easy to sweep under the carpet, except it's, it's painful. Yeah, yellow skin. It must be an oriental, Bart Simpson. No, orna ornamental. 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 All right. 
my parents' name are Morris of Barbonell and uh, Miriam of Barbonell. And uh, they came over to this country in about the early 1950s, 1951. Uh, they were from Poland. Uh, during the war, they were, uh, of course, in Germany during the war. And uh, they fled Germany right after the war. My dad was in a concentration camp during the, uh, during the, uh, the war in Germany. During the war, uh, my mother had quite an experience with uh, she and her four brothers hid out on, on farm, uh, various farmlands, I guess. Uh, Polish farmers took them in and um, they hid them in a, in a big barn. And that was, uh, I guess, it was quite a traumatic experience because uh, the Germans came by there and uh, they obviously were searching for any Jewish victims and, and fortunately the Polish people uh, protected them and they didn't, you know, uh, tell on them so they were found. My stepsisters, grandfather and my stepdad were brothers, so there was relation. And there was, that was a family with a father, mother, and three daughters, four daughters and a son. Two daughters were married, and one had the little girl, which is my sister. And they were all in living in one house with a hiding place partition in between the rooms. And that went on for months. And then my aunt said, I cannot handle this anymore. Because at that time it was winter time. And you couldn't cook because if you were on the list by the Nazis, you know, and uh, uh, you were that address they had to, t you know, had to take you, and if they didn't find any people home, they came back and they came back because they felt they must be in hiding somewhere. Sometimes they will go back to their own house. So that means in the winter you couldn't cook because they would smell it. You couldn't have to heat them. Then they know there was somebody living. So your furniture and everything was there because sometimes it took a long time before they took the furniture out of the houses. So they were living like this for months. And finally, even with the baby, of course, my stepsister was six weeks old when they took her parents. So then finally one evening my aunt said, I, if they come tonight, and they came every night. If they come tonight, I am going to go. And so she did. She went with the two youngest children. Then my... Where did she go? With the, with the, uh, the Nazis, with the SS. They come every night. See, once you're on that list, and they don't find you home, they keep coming. You didn't have a chance to go back or you have to go in hiding. But they, every time they went, they went. They, they went every night, like they will say, sooner or later we're going to get them. And that's exactly the way it was. So then my, her other daughter and her husband, they caught them on the street. And see, they see in their names, if you know, they have a list, for instance, now, uh, let's say Gina. Tonight is Gina, we had to pick her up. If Gina is not there, we didn't get him, it's still on that list. That name is still on. So they catch you on the street. It's like registered. And in front of the window was a coffee table with a little bench on each side. It was covered with linoleum, and there was a rug on top of the linoleum. When we realized that we needed a hiding place, um, two friends helped me. They, we made a, a trap door, a wooden door that you could open and close, and they had to dig out the dirt from underneath uh, with shovels and put it in buckets and take it outside. The hiding place was big enough for the father to uh, have a chair and a desk down there because uh, he was writing his PhD thesis at the time. And um, sometimes he spent a long time in that hiding place. Uh, the children were in there as little as possible. And I didn't always put them in. It depended on what, what the threat was. And somebody must have seen it one time. And he was on a Saturday knocking on the door. And he were three Dutch Nazi police. My mother wasn't there, my youngest brother, my father, and I were home. And uh, he said, you have people hiding here. And then my father said, how can I hide people? I'm a Jew myself, how can I hide people? But they were underneath the floor, because we always looked at the front door if before somebody came, we let somebody in. 
and uh, they kept looking and they kept looking and they kept looking and they found one hole and they looked in there but they didn't dare to go in there and believe it or not they went out on the street and across the street there was a deep pole place you know and my father used to have a restaurant, and he knew a lot of people used to come to his restaurant and eat. And it happened to be that those Dutch Nazis, they say, hey, would you like to make some money and crawl in a hole and see if there are some Jews in there? They didn't dare to do that themselves because they were afraid that maybe somebody cut their heads off, you know. Or somebody, some of them were like that. My, like my dad too say, if they get me ever alive, never get me alive, I will kill some of them if they get me, that is, he would have done it. So then the guys know where we live, said, no, not us, go there yourself. Which they never did. And they left the house. Sometimes you were warned that the Nazis were coming that night. And the village had 2,000 people in it. And one night we knew that they were coming with 5,000 with 5,000 men in troops to comb the village. Um, that, that was quite a threat. Sometimes you didn't know, but if you heard trucks at night or any other motorized vehicle, you knew that it could only be the Nazis because there was a curfew. Um, you had to be in at, at a certain hour so that if you heard a truck outside, you knew that it was danger. And uh, when I heard the truck, I would hear the truck, and I could always get, get them into the hiding place before they stopped and came through this rather narrow gate and, and walked up to the house. My mother in the war was at one point found by, a, by German soldiers. There were a couple of German soldiers that saw her running in the field. Uh, and um, I guess what had happened is, uh, they had shot her. One of the soldiers told her to stop and she wouldn't stop and they shot her in the back. And um, she actually fell down at that point and she did pretend that she was, she was dead and they did uh, kind of come over to her to try to check her out. I guess at that moment, one of the German soldiers from another distance alerted her to something else that was happening that was important. So it drew them away. Otherwise, they would have no doubt looked at her more carefully and thought that she wasn't dead. And uh, then they might have, you know, killed her at that point, but I guess she did. At that point, she was pretty badly hurt, and I guess she kind of crawled away and escaped from, from this area. And finally, she went to a hospital, and they removed the bullet. She did um, show me on her back where the bullet was, was right on the left side, right below the shoulder blade. I think there are, there are almost sometimes people feel strange about categories of survivor. Most people want to, most people when they think of survivors, think of people who survived the, the death camps. Um, but there are people who survived in other ways, um, who, uh, um, who hid or escaped or, uh, um, or even uh, managed to get out as the war was beginning but left behind um, family and friends and, and a whole life that went up in flames. Um, that's surviving too and uh, um, I think um, those people have a tale to tell as well. But that hiding place, it was in March, it was cold. And it was, in Holland, the houses are crawl spaces. We don't have basements, you know, sand, because it's so far below sea level, you know. So hours when my mother came home, and my brother came home, and my father was telling that, and we didn't dare yet to let them come out, because we were afraid maybe they'd come back. It was, it was like about 11 in the morning when that happened, and it was like already 4 or 5 o'clock. And finally my father said, he called and called him, and we didn't hear any voices. And my father then went crawling, it was by that time 6 or 7 o'clock, it was dark. And he crawled in that space, now you have to know, let's say this is the house and the under is a crawling space, and next to it is the staircase, what goes up three floors. And those Jewish people were already taken, so that was empty. And uh, my father went in there, and my my cousin and my uncle were not there. Finally, my father saw, you know, if you crawled, you went in that 
space from the next from the staircase where the gas line and everything is and he pushed the door open and then he went in there he went all the way upstairs because we didn't know he didn't know where else to go and he went all the way up to the attic because the doors you could have were sealed you know when they were sealed and he went to the attic and then he saw a little window was open and it was cold because when they left in the crawling space they didn't have anything on they didn't have a jacket on and he stood and now we're roofs are like this, the Dutch roofs are like this, you know. And he and my father then stick his head out of the window and my uncle and my cousin were standing against it. Can you imagine this much in three floor or four floors high to stand there until finally somebody came telling that they could get out. And the saddest part is in a, in a week they were taken anyhow. So that was the ho always things that you went through. There was always a hope, and then you, all what you did, it was for nothing. I think that as rescuers, I, I disagree with the notion that we were heroes and heroines. That's uh, definitely not my opinion, nor of any other rescuers that I know. Um, but I. I suppose that we do have a certain amount of uh, creativity and imagination that, that's helpful. Um, uh, the, your comment that um, th this film was about rescuers and, and victims, and one of the important things to know is that uh, a lot of the victims were also rescuers. Part of the story of the Holocaust is really um, an exposition of, of both the depths and heights that humanity can reach. And uh, it's a story about us, but uh, and, and, and it's, a, it's a uniquely Jewish story too. I, I think we couldn't just substitute another group and have the same story with the same results. Um, and, and it's important not to make it just a universal story, but it certainly has universal implications and it certainly is powerful and important for everyone. Um, and uh, um, it has a, a, a tremendous amount to teach in, in so many ways, on so many levels. You know, they asked me so many times to talk about it. This time I thought I might as well do it because it gets me so upset for a couple of days. Yeah. And sometimes I, I, I think I want to just totally not even think about it anymore because it is every time it, when you, it, it does stir up so many things again. You know, you go through the whole emotional time. It is emotional. You know, and it, it never leaves you. And you want sometimes to, to, that it leaves you. And then something like this stirs it all up again. And it takes me a while for this to... I can understand that the, that the soldiers from Vietnam didn't want to talk about it. And you know what they say, and my psychiatrist, because I sometimes went to a doctor, there's nobody who can help me, and I tell you why. The best, sometimes the best remedy is to talk with the people who went through this. So when I go to Europe, and I can talk among my people who understand it, who can understand me, that relieves me more than talking to a doctor who don't know what the experience is. What can she tell me what to do? I can tell her what to do, but she cannot tell me what to do. Yeah. And see, and when there's soldiers from Vietnam, they're among each other, they can cry their hearts out and they can talk about it and they feel more relief. Because there's no psychiatrist who can help you. None. And I come to, come, came to that conclusion and she agreed with me. We have been rich as a, in, enriched as a Jewish community and uh, as a city with Holocaust survivors in our presence. Um, the children who are in public schools today, and in, in any school today, um, no doubt will hopefully um, yeah, uh, live in a world where there are no Holocaust survivors. Um, so we really are in a, in a unique period of time. Um, when, when I was in school, uh, when we were children, um, survivors weren't yet talking about their experiences. Um, in another generation, there will be no survivors to talk about their experiences. So it's really important for, uh, for kids to come in contact with these people. And we're, we're fortunate that there are so many in our community who are willing to go out and speak. 
Um, I've been with Holocaust survivors who have gone into some of the most, you know, I, I can't think of a good word other than precarious of situations in uh, um, uh, classes that are reserved for kids with, with specific behavior problems, in classes where uh, um, kids have had all kinds of other issues in the past of uh, paying no attention to anyone that comes in and seeing them riveted to survivors tell their tales. Um, so I think that uh, um, uh, there's, there's nothing there that needs to be sold or needs any kind of um, you know, uh, PR to surround it. Uh, I, I think kids instinctively sense that they're in the presence of someone who's had a profound experience. Strong defense against it if and when it does start. So I wanted to uh, uh, make it clear that the opposition this to a, Nazi fascism Supported by a guy named Eli Wiesel, who was a Holocaust survivor. Military action. If so, I will do what I can. You're Ed Wiesel? Are you with an organization or? No. Just myself. It's a good sign.